Hey everybody, my name is Paige and I'm here to welcome you to our online weekend experience. We are so glad that you're joining us. If you're a returner, um, have been joining us for a few weeks or even a year now, um, we're glad to see you again. And if you are a first time guest, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. So a few things to point you to, as we've been talking about quite a bit now, baptisms on June 27th. So if you're interested in getting baptized, want some more information, um, you can email us, come talk to us in person, um, call the office, anything, and we will get you connected with the right people, the right conversations and all of that stuff. And then second, there'll be a graphic that pops up on the screen now. And this is about our July calendar, our July schedule. So there's a lot coming up in July. July 2nd is a free, 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 free family movie night at Lake 8 Cinema at 6 p.m. This is in Barberton, so if you just type into your GPS, Lake 8 Cinema, it'll come up and it'll get you right to where you need to go. The movie is Soul. This is an awesome movie, I think. Haven't seen it yet, so I'm very excited about it. And then July 17th, we have a family kickball tournament, 12 to 5 p.m. at Edgewood Park. And then July 26th to the 30th is Bible Camp Grades, kindergarten through completed fifth grade. So if you know families who would like to get involved with that, um, kids who would like to come, or uh, parents who would like to serve, or teens who would like to serve, um, contact Tyler Jensen. You can also email us, talk to us in person, call the office, and we'll get you hooked up with who you need to be with. So we're so glad that you're here. Why don't you enjoy the worship, and we'll get started.
Barberton, it's good to be with you via video. My name is Ethan, if I have not had the privilege of meeting you. Uh, Joel is out this week. He's getting to celebrate with his sister. She's getting married over the weekend, and then he gets some good time with the family. So I'm happy and counted a privilege to be able to be with you uh, this week. And as we jump in, uh, I want you to get a Bible out. So if you got a Bible or you got your phone, get it to Colossians chapter 2. And then I kind of have a question as you're working your way towards that is have you ever wondered um, what life's all about? I, I was coming across something as I was uh, prepping for this week, and I thought, man, this is going to be super helpful uh, to you guys. So as you're getting Colossians 2 in your lap, you can kind of listen into this. Is This is life explained. On the first day, God created the cow. God said, you must go to the field with the farmer all day long, suffer under the sun, have calves and give milk to support the farmer, and I will give you a lifespan of 60 years. The cow said, that's kind of a tough life. You want me to live for 60 years. Let me have 20 and I'll give you back the other 40. And God agreed. On the second day, God created the dog. God said, sit all day by the door of your house and bark at anyone that comes in or walks past. And I will give you a lifespan of 20 years. The dog said, that's way too long to be barking. Give me 10 years and I'll give you back the other 10. So God agreed. On the third day, God created the monkey. God said, entertain people, do monkey tricks, make them laugh, and I'll give you a lifespan of 20 years. The monkey said, how boring. Monkey tricks for 20 years? I don't think so. The dog gave you back 10, so that's what I'm going to do too, okay? And God agreed again. Then on the fourth day, God created man. God said, eat, sleep, play, marry, enjoy your life, and I'll give you a lifespan of 20 years. The man said, what? 20 years? Only 20 years? I'll tell you what. I'll take the 20, and I'll take the 40 the cow gave back to you, the 10 the dog gave back to you, and the 10 the monkey gave back to you, and that makes 80, okay? God said, okay, you've got a deal. So this is why the first 20 years we eat, we sleep, we play, and we enjoy ourselves. For the next 40 years, we slave on the sun to support our family. For the next 10 years, we do monkey tricks to entertain the grandchildren. And for the last 10 years, we sit in front of the porch and bark at everyone that goes by, right? Life has now been explained, right? I, I was coming across that. I just thought that's hilarious. Paul, what he's getting ready to do in the book of Colossians is he's going to explain life with Jesus with this church in Colossae. And as he's running into it, he's worried about some of these cultural pressures that we talked a little bit about last week, but these cultural pressures that the church was facing at the time, he was worried that it would distort the pureness and the goodness of the gospel. And so Paul almost starts off with reviewing what we talked about last week a little bit. So he starts off in Colossians 2, verse 1. He says, I want you to know how hard I'm contending. I'm on your team, is what he's saying. And for you and for those in Laodicea and for all who I've not met personally. We said this last week is that Paul wrote this little letter to a church that he had never met before. But he had a pastor buddy that was out there. He was kind of a friend of his. He helped coach him. And his name was Epaphras, Epaphras which I think is a great baby name if you're looking. But Epaphras is the pastor out in Colossae. And 
Paul's writing this letter and he says this, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine sounding arguments. Paul kind of restates his purpose and he says this, the reason I'm writing is to do two things. I want to encourage you and I want to equip you. That's why he's writing Colossians. He says, I want you to draw deeper in your devotion to Jesus. And what Paul's trying to do is he's going to align their allegiance to Jesus rather than just supply a supplement to their faith, right? Like sometimes we look at Jesus and he's just this protein powder that we kind of sprinkle into our life. And Paul's like, yeah, that's not really what Jesus is like. In fact, in Colossians 2, Verse 8, he gives kind of a warning. He says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. If you're in college, he's not saying drop out of your next philosophy course. Okay, that's not what Paul's saying. But what he's saying is he's warning the church. He says, Watch out. Watch out. There's going to be things, there's going to be philosophies, ideas, thoughts that are going to creep into the church to take you captive. That word captive would have meant to rob, steal, or the, the best way to translate it is to carry off, to carry off with. It would have been a word that was used uh, for armies that would go into a city and they'd pillage and plunder the city. And then afterwards, what they would do is they'd take the treasures, they'd take men, women, and children, and they'd carry them off, they'd carry them back to their native land and then enslave them and enjoy the pleasures of the treasures, right? That these armies, he's saying this, that these armies would come back in and they'd have status, they'd feel the sense of significance, security, and satisfaction. And Paul is saying this, he's warning the church that these cultural pressures, just like these armies could come in and attack, these cultural pressures, these philosophies and ideas can do the very same thing. They come in and attack and carry off our mind somewhere off track. He says he's laying out Satan's strategy. He's laying out Satan's strategy, which is this. He wants to first succumb to the cultural pressures. Second, he wants us to subscribe to these convincing perspectives. And third, he wants to supplement our contrary to contrary philosophies. The church in Colossae was having what I call this, simply this, was a Jesus plus mentality or a Jesus and mentality that, yes, Jesus, we need Jesus, but there might be something more or there might be something missing. So Jesus is great. I need him. But I think there's something out there that I need extra. Jesus plus something. These cultural pressures, they would look around outside at the world that they were in. And the, he was worried by looking around, you'd see things that everyone did certain things. Everyone believed certain ways. Everyone did, in fact, what was normal in our culture. Why wouldn't we do that? Which would lead us into kind of these convincing perspectives. We'd start to shift our perspective and go, Man, I wonder why these questions would flood in our mind. Why wouldn't I at least consider uh, something else outside of Jesus? Why, why not have both Jesus and something? Why It never hurts to have a backup to Jesus, like right? Jesus is great, but if I got my backup in my pocket, like a thick savings account or something like that, that's kind of nice too, right? And he's saying this, that it will lead then to these philosophies that we believe, that we would look around at the culture, we would then look inside us and think something's missing, and then we would begin to look like the culture by having uh, Jesus, but we want Jesus plus. It's also nice to have a really thick savings account. Jesus plus. It's really kind of nice to sleep with whoever I want with. Jesus plus. It's kind of great to have my political party in a position that has power. Jesus plus. It's kind of nice to throw back a couple drinks when I'm feeling really stress so it kind of takes the edge off like it was jesus plus something else that would find they'd find satisfaction security stability and status in that's what he was worried about he was worried that these cultural pressures the problem is with these cultural pressures they were attractive and they also seemed somewhat right 
the church in Colossae would have looked like, man, they would have looked around them and they would have gone, it sounds good and it looks right. But we know that everything that sounds good doesn't mean it's always good. And everything that looks good doesn't mean it's always good, right? In Colossians 2, 8, he's saying this. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive through these hollow and deceptive philosophy. He's saying these, uh, the, the best illustration I could think of is a bag of chips. You, you ever had a bag of chips? As a kid, I remember getting a bag of chips and you'd open it up and you thought, man, this bag of chips was nice and full and you'd open it up and it seemed like there was more air in there than there was chips, right? Like this philosophy didn't have a whole lot of thing to it. Like that's what he's saying is you'd open up this idea, you'd open up these thoughts, these philosophies, and it would look attractive, it would look appealing, it might even have a couple aspects of truth, a couple crumbs in the bottom of the bag, and you'd open it up, but it would ultimately be full of air, it'd be full of emptiness and disappointment. And Paul's saying, I'm worried about you as a church, that somehow you'll get caught up in these, and he's the big idea he's trying to convey is this, I don't want you to get hijacked in your faith. I don't want your faith to get hijacked by these ideas. And these two cultural pressures that uh, we looked at last week that were facing the church, Paul's going to unpack this week. Now, the first one, we're going to kind of reverse engineer this passage, okay? We're going to jump around all over Colossians 2. Just, just hang with me, okay? Colossians 2, verse 16, he says this, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or in regard to religious festivals, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come, the reality. However, is found in Christ and Jesus, right? That the first thing that he was worried about was this religious legalism. He was nervous that they would have this religious legalism because Colossae was, uh, had a lot of Jewish roots, uh, they, they were founded in, in a city that had a lot of Jewish roots, and so he was worried that the pressure was going to be mixed Judaism and Jesus together. And the math would go something like this. Judaism was Jesus plus the law equals salvation. That Jesus plus the law equals salvation. I drew a picture for you. I'm not a very good picture drawer, but I feel like uh, it's something like this, that we would somehow, the Jews would believe that if I could somehow climb the law or the good works of the mountain, I could reach the standard that God would want me to be at. So if I could follow the law of the Lord correctly, I would continue to climb the mountain, reaching the standard. I would then scale the mountain to then slide back down and on God's blessing. Like he would somehow owe me God's blessing. And the, the fact is, a lot of us, we live our life like this. Jesus even warned about this. He said this in Matthew 23. He said it kind of different. He said, woe to you. He's talking to uh, teachers and preachers and church people. That's who he's talking about. So woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but the inside are full of greed, self-indulgence, and blind Pharisees first clean the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Let's put it another way, okay? Paul's saying this, or Jesus is actually saying this, that somehow we can clean the outside of our life to try and fix what's going on on the inside. He, a lot of times we think it's, it's to be hypocrites, like we intentionally want to be hypocrites, which maybe it is to try and impress other people, but what Paul, he's getting at something bigger. He's getting at something deeper than that. He's trying to go, maybe if I clean the outside of my life, and my life's a cup, and I try and clean the outside of it, then God will be impressed with what I do that then somehow I'll find satisfaction and security and stability and status if I just clean the outside of my life. And Paul, Jesus is saying, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss it. In fact, um, I love Reese's Cups. They're, they're some of my favorite, uh, some of my favorite candy. I love Reese's Cups. Chocolate, peanut butter, I'm all about it. I've not tried the new ones that are just like peanut butter. I'm really intrigued. I haven't tried them, so if you've tried them, let me know. Uh, how they taste, because I'm a big fan of peanut butter. I like peanut butter probably more than I do chocolate. But Reese's Cup, why do I have a Reese's Cup? Well, I was thinking about this, is that if I offered you a Reese's Cup, and I said, I'll give you this Reese's Cup, or I can give you something bigger, a lot of us might struggle with what to go with. What should we do? Which option should we take? A lot of us might even try the something bigger. Well, what's the something bigger? Imagine I got this Reese's Cup, 
and I shined a light on it in this dark room and it cast a shadow on the back wall of this room. And I said, you can have the shadow of the Reese cup. You're like, what? That is garbage. That's not even real. As soon as you move the Reese cup, there's no shadow anymore. The shadow, he's literally saying this, Paul's saying that what we tend to do is the shadow is the dietary laws, these festivals, these sacrifices, these special days, and people, they run into the shadow to try and impress others by what they can do. They try and impress God by their achievements. They try to win over ultimately God's favor and salvation. And the shadow is the math of this. It's legalism math. It's like morality. So being a good person plus religious stuff minus sin equals God's blessing. That's the shadow that we try and live in. Morality plus the religious stuff. So if I go to church and do the church thing and read my Bible and pray sometimes, I'll even take notes while we're listening to the sermon. And then if I just don't uh, swear or uh, chew or date girls that do, right, then I'll be fine. I'll get God's blessing in my life. And that's the math that most of the American church lives by, is that somehow if we just do the right things, we'll get God's blessing and we'll be able to be saved. And what happens is people run into the shadow believing that there's hope in it, but it's not really reality. And some of us, maybe you're checking this out and and you're not, that's why you avoid church, honestly. You kind of run out of it because you're like, they're a bunch of hypocrites. They want to do a bunch of really good stuff, but you avoid the shadow because it feels like it's not even real and it feels like it's too hard to keep all of God's rules. And what... What Paul is trying to communicate is that both types of people miss out. That legalism is a bag of chips. When I open it up, there's really not all that much that satisfies on the inside. It's a lot of air that leads to emptiness. It's a shadow without a reality. The only person that should worry about their shadow is Peter Pan because his shadow kind of is crazy. It goes beyond reality. But outside of that, he's saying this, that a shadow, you don't need to worry about that. You don't need to focus. Why would you focus on a shadow when you can enjoy a Reese cup? He's saying it's completely different. I was thinking of um, one of my favorite shows is Seinfeld. Seinfeld and uh, George Costanza has got to be one of my favorite characters. And one of the episodes, if you've ever seen Seinfeld, uh, George uh, borrows his dad's car. And he's in there in the car with... Uh, Jerry and Elaine and Kramer, his four friends, and they're driving and on their way, I forget where they're going, but they're, they're on their way to something and they stop uh, in a store and they're trying to find a parking spot and they can't find one. And so what George does is he's complaining about it and Kramer gives the suggestion that, well, what if we just park in the handicap spot? And so George is kind of hesitant at first. He's kind of nervous. He's like, no, I don't want to do that. And then Kramer continues to convince him. The car's kind of like a little uneasy. And they're like, oh, we'll just be real quick. Get in there. Nobody parks in the handicap spots anyway. And so George pulls in there and parks in the handicap spot. They all go into the store. And then they get what they need. They come back out. And it took longer than maybe they anticipated. They come back out. And there's a crowd around his car. You remember this? There's a crowd around his car. And there's cops there. And so they kind of walk up into the crowd and they go, what happened? And somebody tells them that some idiot parked in the handicapped spot. And what happened was there was a person in a wheelchair who was trying to get into the store, but they had to park farther away and they got in an accident and they were rushed to the hospital. And so they were rushed to the hospital and we're waiting for the guy who parked in this handicapped spot to come back out here so we can give him a piece of our mind. That's what they were doing. And George was like, man, well, good luck with that. And so they kind of walk away. They come back several hours later to find that George's car is absolutely destroyed, demolished, obliterated. It's totaled. Like, it's gone. It's his dad's car. And then George is, like, panicked. He's like, well, what in the world do I do? So he goes back and he tells his dad, I think he makes up some story uh, that he got in this accident. He didn't tell him he got parked in a, he parked in a handicapped spot. He finds that out later. But George's dad comes up with an idea that you will now be my butler for until I decide you've paid off my car. So George has to go around and wash his shoes and wipe everything off and be his butler, his dad's butler, right? It's a ridiculous story. It's hilarious and you're captivated by the whole thing and it's a show about nothing really. But you laugh at it and why is it so ridiculous? 
What's so ridiculous because George is his son. His dad is making him his butler. This is crazy. This is not uh, normal relationships, how they're, they work and they're wired. And a lot of times what we do with God is we look to God like we're his butler. And we got to do enough to pay off the sin or the crud or the total amount that we made with the car, right? We try and pay off our life to God. And he, Paul is saying this, that the shadow, it points to someone. It points to someone. It's a relationship. It's a relationship between a dad and a son that the shadow is not a uh, the thing to be focused on, but it's pointing to someone. Legalism is a man-made religion with its rituals and with its rule. Legalism points to rules and passes over a relationship. And that's why some of us are so dog-tired. You're drained. You're irritated. You're discouraged. You're frustrated. And you're miserable. Because you've been trying to do enough to pay off the car that you wrecked, the life that you've messed up. And Jesus, literally, Paul says this later in Galatians 5.1. He says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burned again by the yoke of slavery. He says, the shadow, the shadow, if you focus on the shadow, you'll forget the sacrifice. If you focus on the shadow, you'll forget the sacrifice. And Jesus on the cross is enough for your salvation for my salvation, that we don't have to do anything more. We don't have to try and pay off our life or our car that we wrecked. We're not God's butler, but we can say yes to Jesus. And when we do that, we become in a unique relationship. We become his children, become his children. The second cultural pressure, uh, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about a time when I was a senior in high school we did our senior uh, trip. It was kind of for a group of us. It wasn't anything extravagant like some people do go to the beach or something crazy like that. We went up to Columbus in Easton, you know, that big outdoor shopping center, which was kind of dumb for a bunch of guys. There were some girls with us too, but we're like, that. we had teachers and everything like that. But we're like, man, this is kind of a, a uh, kind of lame field trip for a bunch of guys. We're like walking around a shopping center. So we're like, well, what should we do? So we decided... Uh, I kind of came up with the idea there was a Build-A-Bear, and so I'm like, well, why don't we go in there? I've never been into a Build-A-Bear. I hear about the Build-A-Bears all the time. And so we walk in, and all us guys, we spend way too much money to build bears of the Avengers. So each one of us, we built an Avengers bear. I had Thor, so it was awesome, well worth every penny of it. And I got to pick out his outfit, got to pick out which bear I wanted, got to pick out um, his accessories, like his hammer, his helmet, all that stuff. And we thought it would be funny. So it, a bunch of seniors, almost to be graduates, were walking around Easton with Build-A-Bears dressed like the Avengers. And that's what we were doing. Paul, what he's getting ready to worry about, he's leaning into this next cultural pressure. And what I like to call it is a Build-A-Bear theology. A Build-A-Bear theology that there would have been temples all around Colossae. There would have been all these different religious practices in Colossae that this city uh, had almost any god you could think of. They even had a god for the sewers, which is kind of weird and kind of gross. But Paul, he says this in Colossians 2.18, he says, Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they've seen. They are puffed up with an idle knowledge or idle notions uh, by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and suits grows as God can t causes it to grow. He's worried about the spiritual mysticism is what uh, we'll call it today. Spiritual mysticism. That the Romans and the Greeks, they would have had a math that went something like this. That Jesus plus spirituality equals good living. That Jesus plus this spirituality equals good living. The, the picture that I have for you is like this. They would have this mountain range. And they would have had all these different gods that they could have gone to and worshipped. So they had Apollo, Hermes, Zeus, Alina, Athena, Jesus, Aphrodite, and all of these gods would have represented something they were God over. You have the God of health, money, power, tolerance, mercy, individualism, this wisdom, yet Jesus thrown in the mix of that, and then this sex and love and romance God. 
that you could go and you could scale whichever mountain you needed in the moment and that would lead to your satisfaction and delight or whatever you needed it to do for you. That you could run into each one of these temples and it could do what you wanted it to do. And the church was looking for kind of this out-of-body spiritual experience or they wanted something that would put kind of this quiver in their liver. They wanted an experience and this culture would have been a very superstitious culture. And today, I think Michael Scott says it best. He says, I'm not superstitious, but I am a little stitious, right? And we live a lot of our life like this is that, let's say, let's go back to the cup. You remember this? That legalism tries to clean the outside of the cup. But this spiritual mysticism, it's trying to fill something deeper. And so what it will do is it'll somehow pour Mountain Dew, milk, orange juice, sparkling water, water, whatever kind of liquid it can get in it to try and fill it. And that's what they were doing. That's what he was nervous that they were going to run into to try and find status, significance, security, satisfaction, and stability was just try and fill my life with something or everything. And they would do a build, build a God kind of uh, theology that young adults, high school students, come on, they're, they're, we would run to sex, money, appearance, have flatter abs, power, success, individual life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That we would run to the God of health or comfort to find security and stability. We would run to work to find significance, beauty to find satisfaction. And he, the God of our age, to be honest with you, I really believe this is tolerance. It's tolerance that uh, the slogans of that, if it feels good, it must be good. Be true to yourself. Do whatever works for you. If some's good, more is better. Whatever you believe, you're, you have your own personal truth that nothing's wrong. Sin is imaginary and fake. It's not even real. And tolerance, if you tell me what I have to do or you tell me that I'm wrong, I'll label you a hater and a bigot. And that's kind of the ruling of our day, that we run to the temple of tolerance. We run to the temple or the gods of these different things that we'll, we'll try and find satisfaction. We'll try and find security in or stability in. And we can even do it for Christianity sometimes. I think that's what Paul's leaking into a little bit. Is he saying that we can create a form of Christianity and forget Christ in it? That we can make it weird and never talk about Jesus. We talk about God's called me to this or the Spirit kind of spoke to me. Or we use this spiritual language to describe a spiritual experience that we've had or this quiver in our liver that we can even go to church and the worship, oh my gosh, the worship's amazing. You got to check this place out. Or the preaching, he's phenomenal. He's just so engaging. He's funny. He makes me laugh. And the whole time we can run into these different places in Christian culture and we forget that Jesus isn't even talked about. He's saying, I don't want that to happen for you. That you can run to all these different gods. You can run to even this Christianity that you've created. And Paul says there's even this like false humility that we can tend to get with us that makes us look wise. And the culture, the Roman culture, they would have been fine. Serve whatever God you want. Jesus, if you want to serve Jesus, that's fine. Just don't say that Jesus is the only way. Just don't say that Jesus is the only thing that will satisfy and bring salvation, right? Because if you do, we'll throw you out as a spiritual referee. You do not have that credibility. John Mark Comer, he says this in his book, God Has a Name. I love this. He says the nice thing about made-up gods, the nice thing about the made-up god of sex or, or beauty or money or a Christianity of our own making is they agree with you on everything. And they let you live lives as you please. But unfortunately... They are incredibly boring and flat and humdrum because they don't actually exist. And I think that's so true. We, our culture, we kind of make our own gods. Paul even says it like this. He, he compares it to a human without a head, which isn't really a human at all. He compares it to this spirituality without Jesus is like a human without a head. It, it doesn't work. It can't exist. It's directionless. It has no uh, meaning because you can't, you, you need your brain, you need your eyes, you need your ears. Everything's going on to move the rest of the body. He says Christianity or 
spirituality without Jesus is like you're removing everything. You can't do that. It it doesn't exist. That spirituality misses the singularity. It misses a direction. Spirituality without Jesus, just like legalism, is a made-up religion. It's a made-up religion too. And Paul ends kind of this chapter, he ends it by saying both of these things lead to the same place. We'll see it in Colossians 2.20. He says, Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though do you still belong to the world, do you submit or walk back into its rules? Do you ha- do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. What's he saying? Legalism and spiritual mysticism, they can look like the answer. They can look like wisdom. They can look like the things that bring us satisfaction, status, security, stability, and significance. But ultimately what happens is the reason they look so good is they're disguised by this devotion and discipline. In fact, what he's saying is the whole world gets caught up in the same old rat race. They're they're, they're all doing the same thing. So why wouldn't the church run with the world and kind of do the answers the world's doing? They look okay. They look like they're doing it. They're, They're real disciplined in what they're doing. It looks really good. It looks like they've got it all together. But what he's saying is... When you chase after that, everybody's chasing after the same thing. That's like a bag of chips. It leads to disappointment. It leads to emptiness. It leads to a bunch of air. It's like a mirage in the desert where you just got to climb one more hill. You just got to keep going. You just got to make it a little bit farther, and then we'll get there. And he says it's a mirage. It, It doesn't even exist. It looks like it does, but it doesn't exist. He says the real answer is found in Jesus alone. First Corinthians 2, he says, my message and my preaching were not wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. What power? Well, Colossians 2, back there, okay, 13, he says this, when you were dead in your sins and the in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us of our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. That the gospel is simply this, Jesus plus nothing else equals everything. The power of the gospel brings real status, real security, real significance, real satisfaction, that everything else is foolishness compared to the fullness of Jesus, that Jesus is enough. He is it. He is who he said he is. There is nothing else. That God literally scaled the mountain, so to speak. God came down the mountain in the picture and form of Jesus. That's what this this picture is. The, uh, The picture that God came down in the fullness of Jesus. In uh, Colossians 2.9, he says this, For the in Christ all the fullness of his deity lives in bodily form, that in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority, that his deity, Jesus' deity, and Jesus' death gives authority over man's made-up ways of living that the cross crushes all other philosophies, that Jesus is the only one that can you can find true satisfaction, true significance in. That Jesus is it. That if I have Jesus, Paul's saying, if you have Jesus, you have everything you need. You have everything you could ever need. That if the ocean, the, the cup of your life, the cup of your life actually drops in the middle of the ocean of the gospel, that when you're, when you're a cup in the middle of the ocean, you have plenty of water to drink from, right? You have plenty of water to fill you with. But then, really, if you're a cup in the middle of the ocean, you're caught up in something so much bigger than yourself. 
you are not the main focus, that, G, that Paul is urging us that if we drop our life in the gospel of the ocean, what happens is life's no longer about me, that I'm part of something so much bigger, that my priorities will change, that my worries will diminish because I know I have plenty of what I need. That the gospel says Jesus went first for my life to die for me, so I will put Jesus first in my life. Matthew 16, 25, Jesus says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life, whoever drops their life into the gospel of the ocean will find it. That once I put Jesus first in everything, he takes care of everything for me. He takes care of my money. He takes care of my dreams. He takes care of my relationships, my career, my desires, my family, my hopes. That I don't have to worry somehow to try and fill my own cup up, but I just trust it in the gospel, trust it in Jesus. I remember um, Paul, Paul's going to go on to give another picture for you. And, and I remember a time when I came home my parents had just gotten this new house, and, and they had a peach tree in the backyard. It was just growing. It was, it was this tiny little stick of a tree, okay? And we went out there uh, to play Frisbee, and I actually, uh, my family went out there to play Frisbee. We had all our cousins over and stuff, and uh, I hadn't got there yet. I was driving, making my way there, and as I got there, they were telling me this story about my cousin who threw the Frisbee, and as he threw the Frisbee, my other cousin was trying to catch it, and he was running, and as he was running, he just landed drilled this peach tree and it just went poof. it just fell completely down as he apparently i think he caught the frisbee but he just nailed that peach tree and it fell over right why because that peach tree didn't have very big roots it was a tiny little thing and so what my parents decided to do was try and put that peach tree and stick it back up and try and see if they could save it and what happens is the peach tree sat there for a couple of weeks and it looked like it was going to try but it was dead. It was just a stick in the ground. That's all it was. And Paul is saying this, that in Colossians 2, 6 through 7, he's given a picture to us like a tree. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. Live as if Jesus is first in your life. That's what he's saying. Rooted and built up in him. Rooted. Strengthened in faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. He's saying this, it's so simple, it's so simple, and yet so hard for us to do. Live as if Jesus rules and eternity is real. Live as if Jesus rules and eternity is real. There's a quote at the end of Captain America's Civil War that I absolutely love. Uh, it says this, even if everyone is telling you that something wrong is something right, even if the whole world is telling you to move, it is your duty to plant yourself like a tree. Look them in the eye and say, no, you move. Now this sounds like war, and that's, I, I really don't believe that's what we're saying here. It's not what Jesus is communicating at all. But somehow we would live our lives in such a way where we plant our roots in the gospel and let them grow deep. And when we do that, we're, we're not trying to force people to move. Like, if you don't move, I'll move you, right? That's not what we're trying to do. But somehow we are stable in the midst of cultural pressures, in the midst of so many different gods that we could run to. We are stable. We plant ourselves in Jesus. We plant ourselves in his rule and that eternity is real. And when we do that, it absolutely changes that we're rooted in a relationship with Jesus, that we daily dig our roots in the beauty of the gospel. My wife and I, we live right down the road from a boat dock. And on that boat dock, what I see a lot of people do when they're getting ready, I don't have a boat, but when they get ready to get on the boat, they, they kind of have one leg on the boat and one leg on the dock, and they're moving some things and getting things ready and undoing the ropes and making sure we're ready to go. And eventually what happens is they put both feet in the boat. Why? Well, because that's going to hurt if you don't, right? What a lot of us tend to do is when we follow Jesus, we live our life like we're on a boat dock. We have one foot in the boat, one foot on a dock, hoping that the dock will help us or hoping that the boat can help us whenever we need it. And what Jesus is asking us 
whenever you're, wherever you're watching this at, he's asking you, would you jump in the boat? Would you say yes to Jesus that this morning Paul is asking us, where's your ultimate allegiance going to lie? Are you using Jesus as a supplement to your life? Is your ultimate allegiance lying? He's trying to align us back to Jesus. That some of us, maybe you're this person as you grew up in church and you're used to kind of this legalistic, you're trying to pay off what you owe. And, and you've lived in this shadow and you've never actually known someone. That church is not about just doing the religious stuff or trying not to sin. It's so much more. It's knowing a person. His name's Jesus. That you don't have to try and impress God or work your way to God. You'll be exhausted and you'll be miserable. You don't have to some, some of you, you've totally rejected the shadow of church. You've totally rejected church because you see a bunch of people doing the religious thing. And, and this morning, I want you to know you're not rejecting a shadow. You're rejecting someone. And this morning, that someone has a name. His name's Jesus. And the gospel, the reality of the gospel is, hey, here's, here's the goodness. Here's, here's the thing that will satisfy, that will bring security that will bring peace. You can reach out and take him by the hand. And it seems too easy. It seems too simple. Some of us in here, we've lived our life like we're the cup and we're running to the fountain, the soda fountain, the pop machine, and we're just going down the line trying to fill our life. And we find out we're more of a mess than we're actually filled or satisfied. This morning, Jesus is saying, you don't have to exhaust yourself trying to fill yourself with something, the true satisfaction, the true stability, security, status, significance is found in Jesus. It's found in the gospel. It's Jesus plus nothing equals everything. So God, I'm so grateful for the sacrifice of Jesus that he went on our behalf, died a death that we deserved, paid a price that we couldn't pay to give us a life that we could never live. And so God, I pray this morning for, for, for those of us who are trying to struggle to put Jesus first in our life, we're standing on the edge of the dock. We got one foot in the boat. God, I pray we would just jump in, that we would put continue to put Jesus first, that we wouldn't add anything else to the gospel, but it would just be Jesus, that we would find complete security in him, that it wouldn't be in our bank account, it wouldn't be in a person outside of him. But God, we just pray this morning for, for those of us who, who uh, feel like we got to pay you off. God, I pray this morning that they would feel the freedom of knowing Jesus. God, we love you. We pray this all in your name. Amen. I hope you have a great week and uh, take care.